A lot of this work that I'm doing goes, goes with, uh, is with uh, my collaborator, Laurent Noel. Uh, Laurent is a, is a game, was a games developer. Uh, so you can guess already where the stuff is going to go. Um, and what I work with are some of the simulations. Uh, so what I'll be showing you are largely visualizations of simulations of galaxies. In particular, I'm going to focus a little bit around my own research area, which is galaxy, galaxies like the Milky Way. So I think of visualization uh, is well represented by this little cartoon over here. This is Saul Steinberg. Uh, Steinberg used to get cartoons for the New Yorker. Of course, he did lots of other things. Very interesting. The target audience of visualization is, is twofold. Uh, there's the general public that come to see the pretty pictures and try, and try to you know, look at everything in five minutes and understand everything about the universe in five minutes. And then you have the more specialist audience that try looking for correlations or maybe anti-correlations that are hidden deep in your data that are hard to uh, tease out unless you're able to actually look at the data directly. Uh, and so the software we're developing is very much in, in this spirit. But we use it a lot for public outreach, but besides the public outreach, and that has been its primary focus so far, um, but we also use it to when we have simulations, we want to have a, a good look at what's going on in there, we use the, the, the software to look in there. NASA already knows how to do this. NASA has done this for a long time with, with the Hubble Heritage images and so forth. You just combine a bunch of images and different wave bands, and then you, you get these startling images. This is this gallery that NASA has produced from the Hubble Space Telescope and lots of other instruments. Uh, and arguably, this one saved the Hubble Space Telescope. This is not totally trivial to do with simulations. Uh, in order to get multiple bands, you have to do a lot of processing. Uh, and of course, by simulations, I mean people mean various different things in astronomy. I'm not talking about simulations on these sorts of scales, these really fantastic simulations that, for example, Matthew Bates is doing on, on the small scales looking at star formation. When you have these simulations, this is, uh, like I said, star formation, cluster formation. Uh, you will, people often produce movies, I produce movies, and then afterwards you say, oh, there's something really interesting going on in there. If only I had the foresight to put put my camera in there. Um, and what, we, what we're developing is something that helps us do that sort of thing. Now, simulations in, in galaxy formation span uh, a large range. Sarah has already given us a, a short introduction. In one instance yesterday, uh, there's simulations now approaching 10 to the 11 particles. Uh, this is an example of a purely dark matter simulation. This is the so-called linear simulation. The, the latest version of that is approaching 10 to the 11. Uh, and the other big one that people talk about a lot now is the illustrious simulation. Uh, with, again, large numbers of particles and many, many galaxies in them. I'm going to focus on, on simulations more like this, where I'm, I'm interested in forming a single galaxy, but it's a single particular galaxy, it's a galaxy like the Milky Way, because we don't have a lot of simulations like this, and that match uh, a lot of the properties of the Milky Way. Uh, so this is an artist's conception of what the Milky Way looks like. Uh, the artist has by hand put in there that there are there's star formation and there's blue spiral arms of galaxies. That the amount of mass actually in the spiral arms is typically not that very large, but they produce a lot of light because there's young stars. I'm sure you all know this because you're all astronomers. This is our uh, attempt at building a Milky Way model, uh, and I'm going to focus in particular a lot on the bulge region because there's a lot of interesting science going on at the moment right now on the bulge. And this only actually reaches about 10 to the 7 stellar particle level. Uh, getting higher than that is, is quite challenging still. Um, but those particles have positions, velocities, chemistries, ages, etc. Lots of tags that we want to look at, that we want to try to dissect the bulge by, you know, when we're doing visualization, we want to visualize all these different things. Um, so one thing we can do if we're interested in looking at different bands is we can always attach to each single star particle uh, spectral energy distribution, uh, single star population. So we go from that, we add to the single star population SED, and then we end up with spectra, which I don't know that you can see, but there's uh, lines there, and then we can recover the kinematics, for example, from spectra like that. So this is a way of trying to uh, recover uh, spectral energy distributions of galaxies at particular positions. Um, but this does not include that pesky stuff, the, the dust. 
Uh, and doing the dust is quite an involved problem. Uh, and at the moment, we don't really have a good, fast, interactive way of doing that. And the, the problem arises because if you imagine you have your single star there, and it emits a ray of light in this direction, that ray of light, well, some of it will pass straight through, if we're thinking the classical limit. Some of it uh, is absorbed over there, and then emitted, for example, in the infrared. Some of it is headed into a different direction with a slight change in wavelength. Etc. And if you have to do this for every star, that becomes computationally very difficult. This is the problem of radio wave transfer, which I'm sure many people are aware of. So the way we've, we've gone about working on this with one of my colleagues at UC LAN is to define spheres of influence, that each star influences the radiation field within the coming up from, from a certain region, uh, and then by breaking it up into these sort of clusters like this, we're able to speed this up significantly. Uh, and we can run these on the supercomputer and, and the, on the time scale of, for each band in about a day. But that is still fairly expensive. We have to make decisions about, you know, does this individual star affect the, significantly the flux coming out of this cell, this cell, and this cell? And that decision is based on things that are non-local to this particular star. So if there are nearby stars to those cells, those cells contribute more Weight to the, to the radiation coming up from these cells than it does, unless the light from those stars is blocked by, by dust clouds, let's say. There's something blocking that light, so the light from these guys never reaches those cells. So this is a complicated problem to solve because you have to make all these sorts of decisions along the way. Another example is if there's many stars, instead of just one star, there's many stars on this side, then again, the contribution to the radiation field from cell 3 of these stars becomes important. So, nonetheless, we sort of, we've solved some of these problems without going into technical details. This is the level of which I'll the technical details. And we get uh, images like these. This is showing you what the, this particular model that I showed you of the Milky Way looks like in the UV, in the V-band, in the infrared. Uh, and uh, we're reproducing a lot of features, tint and layers of gas and dust. Uh, a, a significant bulge in the center. I don't know how well you can see it. There's a bar in the center of the galaxy, like in the Milky Way, which you miss in the UV. And by, once we produce these sorts of images, we can ask questions about, for instance, which of these bands can give us good tracers of star formation. Um, so I'm going to pause it there and move forward. If I look at 24 microns, for instance, at any particular point, like, for example, this nuclear disk that has formed here. Uh, what is the fraction of the radiation that you're observing at this wavelength uh, that comes from young stars, stars younger than about 100 million years? Uh, and you can only do that by actually doing the full radiation transfer. But it's, a very, it's still a, an expensive calculation. We haven't managed to speed this up significantly yet. Now, the thing that we're aiming for in particular is to get to the point where we have the Gaia data, and we'll get to the Gaia data, we'll get SSD as well, but to take all the data digested into our code and basically be able to display this data interactively. And, you know, Gaia is going to get us positions, velocities, and speeds, etc. Just this is. Um, and so, uh, some of the science that comes out of that is, if I, if I step back a bit, if we look towards the bulge of the Milky Way, in recent years, 2011, we discovered that as we look towards the center of the Milky Way, towards the bulge, what we find is not one peak of the light distribution, but we find two peaks of the light distribution. And what that is telling us is that along the line of sight, there are two density maxima. And effectively what's happening is if we are sitting up here, we're looking in this direction, the, the bulge of the Milky Way has this sort of funny box, box shape. There's a peak in the density over there, and there's a peak in the density over there. And so you get this double peak in the magnitude distribution, when if you look, for example, for uh, at the red clump giants, uh, which are sort of standard candles with a narrow magnitude range, um, then you, you pick up two regions where they peak, and that has has has, has um, that we, have, we think we understand how that forms. That's related to the fact that it, the presence of a bar in the center of the Milky Way, and lots of galaxies external to the Milky Way have these sorts of shapes. This is the image, so in this image we would roughly be over here, maybe 25 degrees away from the wall. 
it's got this uh, bow tie shape. This is the image as the dinosaurs would have seen it. So for the dinosaurs, they, they looked up at the sky and they thought they were seeing this. Uh, and it was to their, to their regret that they didn't take the sky as a threat, seriously enough. Um, one of the things we, we also have discovered recently is that there is a gradient in the metallicity. And that gradient in the metallicity uh, has it, it is reflected also in the shapes that we see. Uh, so the, the, the close to the mid-plane, the stars are relatively metal-rich, and they get more metal core as you move away. And models quickly reproduce that, that you are metal-rich uh, <coughs> as, as you move towards the mid-plane. But what was surprising to a lot of people was this, that if you look at where that double peak was, that double peak occurred primarily in the, at the metal rich end of the, of the metallicity distribution function. That if you look, say, at that 7.5 degrees here, right from the midplane, <coughs> that metal rich distribution is this red line over here. Whereas the more metal poor component, say component C, appears as a single component. There's maybe a little bump there, but it's nothing very significant. And as you move further up, it's again the metal rich end that you see. Uh, the double peak, but not in the metal core population of the C blue line. So what's happening? Why, why does that happen? That's still not an answered question. Uh, sorry. Uh, we still don't really understand what's going on there. One idea is that this is somehow to do, we're seeing multiple components, we're seeing either two bulge components, or we're seeing the effect of a thick disk where component C might be the thick disk projected project from the center of the Milky Way. What we'd like to do is we'd like to be, to be in a position where we can actually literally interactively slice the Milky Way in these variables and start to understand this. So the way we've been going about it is to develop, um, we've been developing what is effectively uh, a, a software that relies on GPU technology. So um, like I said before, my collaborator Laurent is, is coming from the games industry. The games industry is huge. Um, the, the, the revenue from these projects exceeds, exceeds what comes out of film and TV and so on. Um, and typically projects are very large collaborative things. You have uh, a bunch of artists also working on projects to develop the theme of the game. We don't have that, we're really just focused on the science. And now we get the science out of it. Um, and so the, the, the key thing that has driven our software, and I'll demonstrate this for you in a bit, is the GPUs. Uh, we want to do as much of the calculations necessary for, for visualizing directly on the GPUs and try to keep the work on the CPU side as light as possible. Um, in games, of course, this is, this is what drives the game industry that's driving the, the GPU technology. Um, is this big data? Well, in the game industry, they're often dealing with you know, lots of detail, blades on grass level. However, those, those details are procedural. They're, they're defined, for instance, by fractals, let's say. So they're not necessarily uh, in independent data points in the same sense that we think of a single star as being an independent data point. Uh, but you still have to manage lots and lots of what, millions of entities, uh, many gigabytes of data. So we're not talking about data uh, structures, the size of some of the things we've heard so far, uh, but it's still a complicated process to visualize. And uh, you have to manage all of this in real time. You can't rely on what you don't want to do is rely on letting a computer crunch on this for, for a few hours and then coming back and seeing it. You want to do it in real time because that's how we discover just by looking at it, what's in it. So the example I'm going to show is Galaxy Flyer, our simulation. Uh, We'll, take, we'll digest a, a single simulation and allow you to fly through it. This is a simulation that one of my PhD students is working with. It's, it's a simulation of a cosmic volume where we look at galaxy formation and what the galaxies are doing in that volume. And this is roughly already at about the stage of um, a fent of the Gaia data set, the size of the Gaia data set. And actually what we can do is we can just simply to develop our, our software, we can take this and put multiple versions of it within one, one file. So that the largest we've been able to do this way is four copies of it. So that ends up being about a quarter the size of the Gaia data set that we're going to get. 
Uh, and, it, and, and we're targeting being able to produce <coughs> images at about 30 frames per second. Uh, and we, we're reaching that, that, that target with, with what we call the, the challenge simulation. Um, it has to be done on cheap hardware. If we have to buy very expensive hardware, that's, that's defeating the, the goal. It has to be uh, very quick pre-processing. The pre-processing is very straightforward. I'll show you what we're involved in a moment. Uh, and it has to create images accurate enough that we use them for publications and yet still be attractive for public outreach. We've published a couple of papers where we've shown images from this and we've used them at public outreach events such as this and people react to it very, very positively. They can fly around. There's a lady in that corner holding an um, Xbox controller in her hand and flying around. So it's a big simulation where we're studying uh, the interface. Uh, and people will just look at dark matter, turn on, turn off dark matter, stars, gas, etc. Uh, and it's very intuitive how to go about it. So the, the basic algorithm is quite straightforward. It's something that's been around for quite a while. You build a tree, <coughs> and we have various options for the tree we build. Uh, and then when we, when we want to visualize, we uh, effectively project that tree against the screen, and then we represent nodes that are <coughs> intersecting the screen, and ignore the ones that are outside the screen. And it's really as, as, as simple as that. We just do it very fast uh, on GPUs with some decision making about how to build the trees, etc. Uh, in fact, the, the levels of detail we show, we track that carefully internally within the code itself. Uh, we, we can make decisions about whether we make decisions on the fly, whether we use a clustering algorithm to decide the levels of detail, or whether we use a grid. Which one you use depends a lot on the, the, the amount of substructure you have, etc. <coughs> and uh, yeah, so this is, this is again the same thing that you know, have an option for clustering or for doing a, a regular grid. And the, 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 so one of the you know, algorithms we use is clustering, and that's also very useful. We, we can directly take some of this, this software and search for clusters in our simulations. Here's an example of, of one of those. And uh, because we're being very careful about uh, the, the software, it's C++, so it's, um, memory is very tight control, um, we, we don't generate too much additional data. <coughs> uh, that we have to keep storing. Uh, so let me, and then I'll go into those details, let me just show you a quick example of this. Uh, like I said, this is mostly... Okay, so this is the, what I was calling before the our challenge simulation uh, without the four times replication. The, the challenge simulation actually has four times replication. So it's a simple Xbox controller, and a uh, person in the middle, not never mind. We can just literally zoom into it, turn the images around. We're visualizing, you can see in the top left corner over there how many particles we have. The simulation in total has about 100 million particles that are being visualized continuously. You're seeing gas, dark matter, and stars at the, uh, at the same time. They're colored differently. I can shut, the, I can shut the components off so you can see how, how the different components look like, but you all see those look directions anyway. And you can shut them off and on from these little controls here that you need the keyboard for, so I'm not going to go up there. But the idea is that we can move this around rapidly in real time zoom into a real system. This is not the highest speed we can go. Uh, if I go too fast, I can fly right through it. This thing is very responsive. It's very interactive. And that is precisely what we want to do. And you can't actually generally, most of the time, see, let's try going to that down here, but you cannot generally see um, uh, artifacts when you're moving around. There are very many artifacts. We've been very careful about trying to do this. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get to a point where we can actually take these, the software and add more features to it. We can already visualize, this is visualizing density, visualize things like metallicity, ages of stars, so that's something that might be interested in. Uh, and then visualize other variables of the system uh, to look at uh, how, how stars of a particular type, for instance, are, are distributed. Um, but the long-term goal of where we're going is we might be able to do this with all sorts of other data. Uh, it, it already has that capability, but we are not, we're not, we haven't explored it in very big detail. So I think, I think I'll stop there.
quick summary of the work. Thank you.